1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2 <clears throat> is where we are. I understand that Cole told me that uh, he started a, a series in, that you're, you're studying together in 1 Corinthians. So I just said, where are you? And he said, we're starting chapter 2. So here we go. So the first five verses again to remind you. <clears throat> and so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, it did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Corinth was a polluted city. It was full of every kind of, of worldly pleasure and vice. As a matter of fact, when Paul spent the uh, year and a half that he spent there, he writes the letter of Romans to the, to the church and the people in Romans. And so if you read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 36, you get an idea of what Corinth was like. To know uh, <clears throat> this situation, here you have the church in Corinth. Now, the church in Corinth is a defiled church. No other way, really, to put that. Uh, its members were guilty of sexual immorality and drunken behaviors, and others used the grace of God to excuse worldly activities. The church in Corinth was a divided church. At least four different groups competed for leadership. To turn a page back to chapter 1. Some of you say, I'm a Paul. I mean, Apollos. Some of you say, I'm a Cephas. Some of you say, I'm a Christ. <laughs> Trying to figure out where that was. <clears throat> so I didn't do that to you. It was a disgraced church. The members permitted the sins of the city to get into the local assembly. And of course, when you have proud people, depending on human wisdom, adopting the lifestyle of the world, you're going to have problems. So in my effort to, to speak to you this morning on this topic, you know, usually I really try to be impressive. You know, I want to be impressive. I want to look good. I want to have a great little ways that I say things that you'll go, hmm, you know, things like that. But this morning, I just can't do that. I can't be impressive because if I'm impressive, then the message is not, you know. So I, I, I'm struggling with that. Matter of fact, Paul, though, uh, you remember Paul, he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. As a matter of fact, uh, in the... Uh, the researchers and, the, and those who are commentators, they say that it was preferred as a school of learning above Alexandria and Athens, where, where Paul was schooled. Uh, but, and Paul obviously was a learned man. We know that about him, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll find in other locations, uh, turn that slide if you will, he quoted Aratus. Now, Aratus was a Greek poet. <clears throat> uh, if you're familiar with the Greek poets, Phenomena was his, his great work. He lived about uh, 300 years before Paul, but in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Paul quotes him. He says, For in him we live and move and we have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Next slide. And then he also quotes in Titus chapter 1 and verse 12, Epimenides, one of the Crete prophets. And he says, and now this is in your Bible. I don't know if you knew that these, these influences that Paul in his learning and his knowledge had reached into the scriptures, but he says, one of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Okay. And this guy was a contemporary of Plato and Aristotle. And then if you turn to the next slide, Menander, he quotes him here in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now, you thought that was just the Bible, but actually he's quoting another Greek philosopher. Actually, this guy's a poet, had 108 plays. Very popular in his day. Again, two or 300 years before Paul. So Paul is a very learned man. He doesn't just know the scriptures of the Old Testament. He has, he has very learned. He could hold his own if he wanted to. But here's what had happened to Paul. Paul had uh, understood that he didn't cater to what his audience wanted. As a matter of fact, Barclay in his commentaries wrote that Corinth put a premium on the veneer and thin thinking. He already knew, and you know this from chapter 1, that Jews demand a what? Okay, we're going to have to work on this, you and me. <laughs> Jews demand a sign, and Greeks want wisdom. Yeah. 
And so he knew this about his audiences. And Corinth was very much a Greek city. And so Paul knew what he was walking into. As a matter of fact, he'd been imprisoned in Philippi. He'd been smuggled away in the night from Thessalonica. He'd been hounded away from Berea. He had wholly failed to make any kind of impression in Athens. And now he comes to Corinth. Do y'all really kind of see that in his travels? Because we kind of look at Paul when we draw from the Scripture and say, man, what a man of God. He's doing great stuff. But as he goes to this, this worldly climate, people are not always accepting that there's, as Mark spoke about in his comments this morning, a God who loves you despite the fact that you don't deserve to be loved. A God who comes and reaches to you when you didn't reach for him. As a matter of fact, Paul would say in the first chapter of this book, he says, once you were not a people, you weren't anything. He says, and now you are. So when Paul comes to Corinth, he knows the audience that's there, and he makes a conscious decision. Turn that slide. <clears throat> Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Who is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And you're going, man, that sounds great, Paul. But Paul is understanding his climate. Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth. And he's understanding the climate in which he's walked into. Keep reading, for Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Paul says, I'm not going to vie with the sophists, I'm not going to try to, to debate, I'm going to keep my thoughts and my comments to know in Christ and him crucified. And that's it. Now you go to the very simple thought. It's a great idea, Paul. But, you know, guys having been raised in this church family, my family used to fill up one of those pews over there. I'm sitting there thinking, it's not all going off the rails when there are a great number of doctrinal theories and positions that you and I can take. It's, it's not altogether unhealthy. In fact, Paul devoted much of his thinking in some of his other letters to talking about some of these situations. Remember, there was this movement of Jews in the church that said, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Remember this? And Paul is fighting that thought. Every time he's, in one, almost every one of his letters that he writes, he's speaking against that. And then there was the idea in 1 Corinthians 15 where some didn't even think Christ had been resurrected. You know, it hadn't happened. And there are others saying, well, it's going to happen. And so there was confusion. So it's not always altogether going off the rails. <clears throat> but, you know, here's this deal. And, and you guys ever seen a, a train wreck? Go ahead. February 3rd, 2023. Remember where you were? Of course not. Because you don't live in East Palestine, Ohio. But on February 3rd, 2023, at 8.55 p.m., a train was going through, rolling through East Palestine, and it derailed. And if you watch the news, you know those cars were carrying, what was it, hydrogen chloride and phosgene, and they burned for like two days. And then they had a controlled burn after that. And so the people of East Palestine, Palestine, they know what a train wreck looked like. They've experienced it. As a matter of fact, a whole bunch of them uh, experienced all kinds of health issues because of that, that cloud of, of burning smoke and what was in that, those cars. They've had a lot of people moved out of that community. If you follow that over 13 months later, many of them have left town, mm -hmm. tried to sell their property, and they can't sell it, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to go buy a property in a, in a chemically induced town where you've... And then those that have remained, they have health problems and issues, right? Those things are ongoing. They understand a train wreck. The decision made in the lead car will, without fail, impact the rest of the connected train. We get that, right? So that's one of the reasons James tells us in James chapter 3, verse 1, not many of you ought to be teachers. Right? Because why? You're going to incur a stricter judgment. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, he says, listen, if you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, what should my precious Lord Jesus tell you to go and do? The one who tells you he loves you, the one who tells, let the, you know, if you're weary, come unto me. He says, take a big old millstone, tie it around your neck, and go jump in the sea. 
That's our Lord Jesus. That's how strong he feels about people that cause train wrecks. You know, in Corinth, Paul determined he would know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Interesting. That means he made a decision not to talk about some other things, right? I wonder, Paul didn't focus on how and how not to worship. I bet you Paul didn't sit for hours on end having gospel meetings or talks about how everybody else is getting it wrong. I'm going to bet that he wasn't teaching Bible classes, defending a lot of doctrinal positions. A year and a half now, he was with them. So I've got to do a little soul searching. Because there's a lot of times that it would be easy to focus on those things. And I've got to tell you this. Uh, growing up in the church, I, I just have to tell you, I have seen, uh, well, as a youth minister one time, I was... Uh, uh, in a church that uh, first thing the elder said to me in the interview was, what have you heard about us? I know ministers who that say that unless you have your doctorate, you can't minister as be a part of the ministering team here. I've been in churches uh, where you can clap and jump in heaven and, and, and have a great time, but you can't do it here. What's a train wreck look like? in the church. Paul determined I would know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Christianity is Christ and Christ is Christianity. Amen? The truth is altogether different for religions of any other founders. As a matter of fact, you can know the principles and forget who founded religion, but you can't do that in Christianity. You must follow the man, Christ. For example, I, I was sitting in a, in a missions class many years ago, back in the 80s, going to school, and, and Wendell Broom uh, was the teacher at that time, and he said, he said, you know, all other world religions, you have to earn, you have to work, you have to do something in order to be accepted by the deity. He said Christianity is the only religion, the only movement where God knows you can't do, and so he comes to you. Isn't that amazing? And then I go, Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Well, why Christ crucified? Why can't we know Christ and him resurrected? I like that one, right, don't you? I mean, the power over death, raised from the dead, destroyed death. The sting of death is lessened. Got a friend that his wife's sister passed away yesterday. And she was in Christ, knew Christ, loved Christ. And he's going, we're hurting. We're hurting, sure we are, but we know where she is. And we're loving the fact that she's home. Isn't that awesome? And Paul says, where, oh, death is your sting? Where's your victory? He says, it's lessened. We still feel it, but it's lessened. I would love it if he said, we wanted to know nothing among you but Christ and him resurrected. As Mark said earlier, he said, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, we of all men are most to be pitied, right? Because your faith's futile. What you've been learning, what you've been teaching, what you believe is futile. It ain't real. He said, but he has been resurrected. Man, if he said, I don't, wanted to know nothing but Christ and him resurrected, I would get into that one. I'd, 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 I'd launch with that, right? But he says, I wanted to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Let that steep in your tea for a minute. I mean, the Jews are going, the Messiah will come, right? He will lead us into a glory that we've never had, not even since the days of David or Solomon. They were waiting on the Messiah. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter confronts them with what they've done with the Messiah, they're cut to the quick. It's a stumbling block. They don't want this. That's not what he's supposed to come for. That's not who he's supposed to be. And the Jews, they don't want to hear that. It makes me guilty. The Greeks, on the other hand, 
They just want the newest idea. They want to think talk about great. They want to spend their time in conceited human wisdom going, you know what, that's not bad, but let me tell you about this. Paul knew his audience. And he says, I wanted to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly, silliness to the Greeks. Remember in Athens when he's walking around and he's talking about that unknown God that he comes upon that, that, that monument to? He says, let me tell you about the unknown God. You know what their response was? Well, this is interesting. It's a new teaching. Let's think on Let's talk on this some more. We'll hear you again. Christ in him crucified? Come on. It was the worst form of death. It was degrading. As a matter of fact, even, even the Old Testament says, cursed is any man who dies on the tree. Christ in him crucified? Really? Hmm. Go ahead and turn that slide. And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come for came to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Paul could have. He could have come to him that way. He could have quoted Aratus. He could have quoted Menendar. He could have quoted Epimenides. He could have done all of that. He could have shown them the knowledge that he had, learned at the feet of Gamaliel, and really sophist, and really shown them this whole connecting work from the Old Testament all the way to the New. Man, it would have been impressive. You know, but a preacher can get in the way of the gospel. You know? Can you hear me? A preacher can get in the way of the gospel instead of being a servant to it. There's a story that is around. There's a little girl, three or four-year-old, sitting in the pew, and a, a visiting preacher came one day, and he was shorter than the normal preacher, and they had a stained glass window with Jesus back behind the pulpit, and she tugged on Mama's arm. She said, Mama, where's... Where's the big man that keeps me from being able to see Jesus in the picture? We can get in the way. If I want to impress you with what I know, if I want to impress you with how good of an orator I am, if I want to impress you with how much scripture I can spout from memory, you will be impressed with me, but you ain't got room to be impressed with Christ. I didn't come to you to, to, to share lofty words. You know how hard that is for me? I want to be impressive. Don't you? Don't you, want to be, don't you want to impress people when you walk in the room? That's why you dress up. That's why you button your shirts. That's why you do your hair. That's why you smell good. I like hugging ladies at church. They all smell good. <laughs> we want to be impressive. <laughs> But Paul says, I didn't want to come to do that. Because if I impress you with me, then I'm not impressing you with he. Now, Paul's not rejecting preaching. I mean, you look at Acts 26, you've got one of the most persuasive preaching moments with Agrippa that you, that you find. So it's not that he's rejecting being persuasive. He just doesn't want you to be drawn to him. He wants you to be drawn to Christ. And i got to tell you, I don't want you to be drawn to me. I want you to be drawn to Christ. The lover of your soul. The perfecter of your salvation. The Jew requires a sign. He wants to be impressed. He wants a visible sacrifice. He wants a priest. He wants religion to consist largely in doing certain acts, which may be supposed to bring in some magical fashion spiritual blessings. Sounds a little bit like folks today who so badly want to be moved physically in worship. Not that that's wrong. Being convicted is a good thing. Then on the other hand, the Greek who seeks after wisdom wants to argue wants to debate, wants to dissertate. They want to demonstrate. They want to talk about abstract principles, strategize principles. Behold the pattern. Sound familiar? Man, I remember the 1950s. 
Well, no, I don't either. I was <laughs> born in 66. But <laughs> first preacher life. But I remember reading those debates, right? Man, our fellows, we like to debate. We would debate. And we would debate on this. And, and, and we would argue the most minute point to win the debate. And, of course, nobody ever won the debate except the one who already thought they'd won it before they ever stepped up to win it. And then I think, in my lifetime, we'll go to war over marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We'll go to war over instruments and worship. We'll go to war over does the Holy Spirit still act and do spiritual, powerful, miraculous things to his people or not. We'll go to war over a number of things. The problem is, is that we quit talking about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the people that would want to talk about, they left the building a long time ago. There are slick models of how to reach people and pull them in. Man, I, I can tell you, so, turn that slide, I'm sorry. I can tell you, uh, yeah, next one. There we go. I, I can tell you that in youth ministry, uh, man, we would do all kinds of things to try to pull kids in, to get them... And I don't know that that's wrong so much as we've got to get to the point of talking about Christ and not juggling knives or whatever or, or chainsaws, you know, just to go get the kids to look this way. And I wonder sometimes if we do that with each other. Because, see, what you draw them with is what you draw them to, yes? What I draw you with is what you're going to be drawn to. And if my human wisdom is what brought you to Christ, then can't human wisdom take you right out of it? So Paul, when he says, my speech, my message, were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Paul's not talking about walking in there and all of a sudden, like in Acts chapter 2 or Acts chapter 10, there's flames on top of his head and people are going, ooh, you know? That's not what he's talking about doing here. He's talking about let the spirit, let the, let the power, the demonstration be in God's work and let me be a herald. Because see, if I wanted to emotionally win you over, I would make it through an argument. I would make it in such a way that, it, that I grabbed your heart and you were moved and convicted. Or if I wanted to argue and I wanted to debate, I would lay the points down and I would tie the, tie the tent down with every peg until there was no other way you could see anything else except the way I said it. Problem is, is I'm drawing you to me. It works, doesn't it? It works both ways. But it is not what the kingdom of God grows by. Amen. What you draw them with is what you draw them to. You know, thinking about this, in these verses that Paul is saying right here, I'm thinking about Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 where Paul says, I want you to work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work to do his goodwill and his pleasure. So you've got this kind of attention thing, right? You don't, you don't earn your salvation. You couldn't work for it. You could never earn it. But you need, to, you need to engage in it. And so in fear and trembling, I step forward, not out of pride in, in, in what I've accomplished or who I am, For God's at work. What would Paul say to you here if he was here this morning? I want you to know Christ. It's not about me, it's about Jesus. Follow him, expect to suffer for his cause and for his name's sake. 
Stand up and be counted. Don't be ashamed and let people know who it is you follow. I think Paul would say all that. But then I think Paul would also say this. We're pretty messy. You know, we are, <laughs> we're pretty messy. Now, I don't want you to know my messes, you know. That's the last thing I want you to know is, is, is how, just how messy I am and in what ways I've been messy. And the bad news is for me is some of you know me since my youth. <laughs> so you know how messy I am. We don't want people to know our mess. But just for a second, understand this. Rephrasing what Paul says, I, I came to know nothing. I didn't want to speak about anything. I want you to know Christ and him crucified. Why crucified, Paul? Because it's in the crucifixion that cleans up your mess. Only in the blood of Jesus Christ am I made clean. I love that. I love that, that picture in Revelation 5. Where, where those people who are under the altar are going, how long, God? How long until you make things right and you, you avenge our blood? You, you take vengeance, you, you make it, you give us justice for the people who have killed us. And it says just a little while longer, and he gives them robes, and it's dipped in the blood of the lamb, and it's beautifully white. I love that picture. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses us. And I don't think of blood as clean. I think of blood as, as red and ugly and dirty and, and, and anything but clean. But because we're messy. You <laughs> think about how messy you are. I've got a friend of mine, James Glover, that's in the prison ministry there. Uh, he's now out. He's got uh, three wives and six, six, baby, six kids and three baby mamas. And I've got a friend, another friend, uh, who his seventh grade daughter, and I do the math, she's 13, she walks across the street the other night to retrieve him from sitting with all the guys, cousins, and everybody else that's doing meth, and takes him back home, 13-year-old daughter. We're messy. We're messy. And you go, but Dale, I've, I've been removed from that. God has sanctified, justified me. He's taken me out of that stuff. You better slow up, because you remember that parable Jesus tells where the tax collector and the Pharisee both go to the temple. Oh, God, I thank you I'm not like Larry. I thank you I'm not like James. Hang on, guys. Who goes home justified? Because you're messy, too. John chapter 4. Jesus arrives at a well. Remember this? And he has this conversation with the Samaritan woman who comes at noon in the heat of the day, so nobody else is there. There's a reason for that. They go through this conversation. She avoids. He talks straight. She avoids. He talks straight. Finally, he says, go get your husband. And she goes, I ain't got a husband. He said, you're right. You've had five, and the guy you're shacking up with now ain't your husband. John chapter 8, they capture a woman. Mm -hmm. And they throw him at Jesus, throw her at Jesus' feet. Never mind the guys, you know, and never mind they knew where to find her, right? And it's all a trap. And Jesus could have dealt with every bit of that, but he doesn't. And he says, looks at her, and of course, you who are without sin, throw the first stone. Everybody starts to leave, and finally he says to her, the most important part of the story, where woman, where are your accusers? There's no one here, sir. Neither do I. See, God sent Jesus to step down into our mess, into your mess. He knows your mess more than you, more than you want to let anybody know. He knows your mess. And then he doesn't condemn your mess, but he calls you out of your mess. Luke chapter 22, Peter's a sword-slinging guy. He wasn't aiming for Malchus's ear, but that's what he connects with. And Jesus says, enough! Picks it up, puts it back. He doesn't join our mess. See, God's not messy. He's perfect. And he will not allow 
mess into his presence. So how do you fix that when you and I are messy? You send a Savior whose blood is perfect. Just saw my mom. You sent a Savior whose blood is perfect into your mess. God knows your mess. He doesn't condemn your mess. And he says, don't stay in that mess. He calls you out of that mess. This morning, Paul says, I, I, I didn't want to know anything about you but Christ and him crucified. Why crucified, Paul? Because God came to your mess. calls you out of it. This morning, we're a bunch of messy people. Can we admit that? <laughs> Hello, I'm Dale. I'm a mess. <laughs> we're a mess. And yet God calls us out of it. He doesn't condemn. Are you listening? He doesn't condemn, but he calls you out of it. So come out of it. If you're not in Christ, if you've not named him Lord, if you've not surrendered to who he is, the Son of God, get out of your mess. Come to Christ. Let him cleanse you and put the robe on. That's pure white. Now, I've got to say something to you Christians. I don't know if this is the disgraced or defiled church. I don't know if the community and the worldly stuff has made its way into the local. I don't know. But individually, John tells us in 1 John chapter 5 through 7, he said, if you're walking in the light, because we don't, you know, light exposes, right? And we don't like being in the light. John chapter 1 says that men love the darkness. That's the verdict. They don't like being in the light because it exposes us. Shows things we don't want. Shows the mess. But John says in 1 John 1, he says, if you're walking in the light, he's in that light. Then the blood of Jesus continually does what? Cleanses us from all sin. Beloved, sister in Christ, brother in Christ, if you're not walking in the light, God will continually cleanse that mess. Give yourself to him, submit to him, and walk in the light. I don't want to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. This morning, live with that mantra. Let God have your mess. Let's stand together. Let's stand.